now we go to uh, part two, and that is uh, business success strategies. Now, I had intended for this to be a half hour, and for those of you who wanted this to be an hour, it'll probably seem like an hour <laughs> anyway. But if you want me to do another 30 minutes sometime, just ask me, and that way you don't have to hurt my feelings by saying, nah, not so much. 60 minutes was enough. So repeating what I said in the last time we talked about business success, which I think was the first Saturday in January, Professor Drucker, again, you have to quit something before you do something else. And David Finkel, again, find that best 5% of your business and expand that best 5% and clobber everything else, because it's that best 5%, that gold, that platinum, that you can duplicate, expand, and get rid of what David calls those shiny objects that keep uh, distracting you. All right, so last time we talked about what are my behaviors that I can reduce or eliminate? And uh, one thing that somebody said to me uh, last night, I had a glass of wine, Marsha and I had a glass of wine with a friend, and she said, how much time do you waste during your workday or that's non-billable during your workday? And I said, well, today I had 1.3 non-billable hours. And she laughed and she said, how do you know that? And I said, because when I do anything that's not billable, I write down a time slip and I write down what it is. So at the end of the week, I know how much time I spent doing things that are not billable. And I know how much time I spent doing billable things. And I know how much time I spent doing things that I get paid a fixed fee on. And, and the key there is the time that it takes me to write that down on my clipboard is really zero time because my subconscious mind does it, I just do it automatically. So when I start a new task, when somebody comes in and interrupts me and says, I got a question for Mrs. Jones. I say, hold on, I write down Mrs. Jones, 1, 11, 22 a.m. And then when we're done with the conversation, if it's a minute, I don't do anything. If it's five minutes, I write down a one tenth of a one percent, I mean, one tenth of an hour time slip. At the end of a 10 hour day, I have 10 hours of time slips. And Kelly comes in and looks at my time slips three to four times a day. Is it, wait a minute, you're missing something. You're at noon and you don't have six hours in. What did you forget to write down? So, that may be my most valuable habit. If I have a second most valuable habit, it's that I do keep a daily to-do list and I list and I hand write it. It takes 10 to 12 minutes and I always get three or four good ideas and reminders when I write down Smith Trust. And then I think, oh my gosh, I could put the mother-in-law in there as a beneficiary and get them a stepped up basis when the mother-in-law dies. I hadn't thought of that. And then I write a little E with a circle next to Smith Trust, which means that's my reminder to send an email about that idea. And then I write down Jones Trust. And I write down a little K with a circle. I've been getting to the Jones Trust for three days in a row. I'm gonna let Ken do it. I'm going to take that imaginary monkey on my back and I'm going to go over to Ken and I'm going to let that monkey climb on Ken's back and it is the Jones Trust. And then when Joan, when Ken comes back to me the next day and has a question about that trust, I'm not going to take it back. I'm going to help him, but I'm not going to take the Jones Trust back. That monkey is on his back. I'm gonna keep my distance, not because of COVID-19, but more because of the monkey. 
So with the COVID-19, the monkey on your back thing isn't as good as it was, but I guess you can imagine a spider monkey and you should probably wear protective goggles in case that spider monkey jumps in your face. Was that a useful tangent? So what we're looking for here is habits and behaviors that will make you more productive. And my friend last night, Margaret, also pointed out that if you can just change your world by 1%, and you could do that just 1% a week for 50 weeks, then you're at 150% making very small changes. So here's another one for you. Who can you be assertive with to save time? For example, I, I tell uh, younger lawyers here, when you get somebody on the phone and they just won't stop talking, they just go on and on and on and on and on. If a person is used to being stopped. So what you can say is, I've got to make a call in five minutes. Just push that in. I've got to make a call in five minutes. And then at five minutes, just say, time for my call. And they will either stop or they won't stop. There's, they'll stop. But if they don't stop, then you simply say, gotta run, click. But think about that. that. That person who works with you in your office who just loves to tell you their problems and the drama of their life is more important than anything you're doing. Can you be assertive with them? Say, hey, Fred, I just I just took a time management course and the 10 minutes that we spend every day I need. So if you want to type me an email about how bad Wilma is, that's fine, but I can't do this anymore. You know, make a list of those people. They are your time wasters. The alternative is the person who says nothing useful and you don't have to really listen to them, but they need to talk. An assistant, sit down and listen to them while you do your other stuff and tell you if they said anything that means anything. So if you're going to committee meetings and the first 45 minutes of the committee meeting is small talk and you choose not to, not to use your camera and to have a responsible person take copious notes, that might be a good idea, don't tell anyone that I uh, said that. So here's some things I've done since that Saturday, since two Saturdays ago. I used to use Dragon Speak and I stopped about four years ago when I switched computers. I never got it back up. I went back to Dragon Speak uh, the day after I said that I would. Dragon Speak is saving me a lot of time. I'm not as good at it as I was, but I could say, I, I could say, hi, Mary, this is Alan. It's great to talk to you. It's been a long time. Thanks for sending me to your email. I have a couple of questions. The first one is, how old are you now? The second one is, what is your net worth? I could speak that fast. It's now all on the screen. I can send it to a secretary to clean it up and send, or I can clean it up myself and send faster than I type. So that's Dragon Speak. Also, if I don't want to record a telephone conversation because I don't want to ask permission, but I'd like to have a transcript of what was said, maybe I turn on the Dragon Speak. I haven't tried that because I usually take notes, but maybe I should put Dragon Speak on my second computer and just say, Floyd, I've got Dragon Speak going. And then I can erase what Dragon Speak said after after I see it. Maybe that's maybe that's a good strategy for you. The other strategy I mentioned was 
I bought a lot of $65 tape recorders for I think about 10 people in the office. And when they see me, they bring their tape recorder. Or when I go to see them, I, I say, turn on your recorder. And then I talk as fast as I want. And I don't have to worry about whether they took notes or not, or go slow so they can take notes. Now, the second thing, and this is gonna save 10 minutes a day. Whenever somebody in my office works on a client's chart, they email me the chart. And in the RE line, it says Mary Hughes chart. So now when I knew, need Mary Hughes's chart, I don't have to go into the directory, which takes two minutes and it's tedious. I just search my emails for Mary Hughes chart. And it may not be the latest one, but it probably is, it pops right up. Another thing that I do that I forgot to mention uh, last week is my printer is my reminder system. So throughout the day, when I get an email I need to answer or a letter I need to handle, or I see a document I need to work on, I just print it. And then at the end of the day, my assistant Riley staples everything on my printer and puts it in what's called the red folder. And as she goes through it, she sees things and she knows what some of those things are. And she handles some of those things as she looks through it. If it's really important, she reminds me. But otherwise, when I the first thing I look at when I get on my treadmill the next morning is I go through that folder and all the things I printed the day before to remind myself of things to do. And then I hand those papers to people who I delegate them to. So just use your printer as a reminder. And I have two printers. You see one of them there and the other one is, where's the other one? The other one's there. So one of those I can print to for reminders and the other I can print to for what I'm working on. And one of them is a color printer, which is a lot more expensive to print on than the black and white. So the price of the color printer was paid for by the black and white copies that I don't need color for. Because one thing I learned was when you buy black and white toner, for a color copier, it's about five times as expensive as the black and white toner that goes in the other copier. And the other thing I learned was the copier guy who fixes our copiers said that our old Hewlett Packard copiers are much more inexpensive on toner than the new copiers that we can buy. So these little things where you improve your business 1% of a at, at a time can be very valuable. So when we're done, if you could print out page 146 on your black and white printer and fill out what your biggest time waster is, it's not a bad idea to walk around the office and ask people what they're doing. Marty Schweitzer taught me that. He was a really good CPA and friend. He died a decade or go or so. And he said, just walk around the office and say, hey, what are you doing? And you'll be surprised at how many times you'll find people doing things they shouldn't be doing that you didn't need for them to do. Just don't do that anymore. It's just a, a good idea. But talking to negative talkaholics is a big one. Another thing that we try to do is we try to convert phone calls to emails. Not because I don't like to talk to people, I do like to talk to people, but I also like to keep people's bills down and I like to make sure I got the right information and they got the right information. So clients who are in the habit of leaving me voicemails get an email back very promptly. Floyd, thanks for the voicemail. The answer is yes. Please let me know how soon you want this to be done. Best regards. Now, hopefully over time, Floyd gets converted to being an email client, not always having to talk uh, to me. All right, so we have lots of habits here. 2,000 hour rule. Um, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers. Once you've done something, for 10,000 hours and you like doing it, 
you will be a genius at it. You will be very, very good at it. So, you know, you see the trapeze artist, you see the juggler, you see the ventriloquist, you see the comedian, you see the musician. What makes them so good that they can do that and you can't? And the answer is 10,000 hours. So just be mindful of this. And I tell the young lawyers and the, and the, uh, the new surgeons, I should say the new lawyers and the new surgeons, because a lot of the new lawyers are old lawyers. If you put in 3,000 hours a year, you'll get your 10,000 hours in in three and a third years. If you put in only 1,500 hours a year, it's going to take you seven years to get to the 10,000 hours. So putting in the extra hours those first few years can be a very important investment. And if you're a Beatle fan like I am, and I'm really enjoying watching these Get Back recordings, uh, they took 65 hours of video of the Beatles rehearsing and recording for the uh, Let It Be album, the rooftop concert, and what became the Abbey Road album. And, and you see how much time they spent and how patient they were and how methodical they were. Now, they only had a six-year run. Think about this. They wrote Love Me Do, their first hit song that they wrote, in 1963 and finished the Let It Be album in 1969. They did all that in six years, but they were together from 1959. And from 59 to 63, they couldn't get anyone's attention. They were turned down by everyone. In fact, in 63, the one record contract they got was the fourth they had tried for. They had three turn down letters. But they and the Rolling Stones had the 10,000 hours done first. Because remember, they went to Hamburg, and in Hamburg, they played nine to 10 hours a day. So they had the 10,000 10, hours in first. So when the world decided, yeah, we like this kind of music, they knew how to write it, they knew how to record it, and they had a lot of competition after the other bands had their 10,000 hours in. So be patient with people. You're not just a genius when you started something. You get your 10,000 hours in. Don't forget to use your subconscious mind. I think people have just forgotten about the subconscious mind. A lot of times people in my office will say, what are we gonna do on this file? Uh, what are you doing on this? What's the answer to this? And my response is, ask me tomorrow. And a couple of people thought that was really rude that I say, ask me tomorrow. But the reason I do it is when they ask me tomorrow, I often have the answer. And where does it come from? I believe it comes from my subconscious mind. Sometime during the day or in the shower or while I'm dreaming at night, the answer comes. So your sleep time, when you wake up, make your to-do list or make your to-do list before you go to sleep. If you make your to-do list before you go to sleep, then you won't have to wake yourself up at four in the morning and say, got to call Fred, got to call Fred, forgot to call Fred. Nope. Once your mind knows that you wrote it on your to-do list, it won't have to remind you of that. But if, you're rem if your to-do list says, figure out the Lowry problem, well, then your mind will work on figuring out the Lowry problem. So that subconscious mind is in there, along with your inner child who needs to be entertained, so joke around and have some fun. Now, lawyers, CPAs, and other financial and other advisors, what do you say about the client 
who doesn't know when to quit. You know, what is it? Tony Robbins says that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So one of the things that Marty Schweitzer used to tell clients, and he had very, very long client conferences, and I learned a lot from those very long client conferences, is he would say, you know, you got to know when to fold them. This thing is not looking good. Yeah, maybe you're just around the corner, but could you bring in a joint venture partner or let's just get this thing done? It, it's a loser. Fold them. You got to know when to fold them. So, you know, listen to that song, know when to fold them, know when to fold them. And when it's time to fold them, when it's getting in the way of your top 5% and it's taking time, money, and frustration, give it away to somebody else, delegate it, know when to fold it. Now, this is something I got from reading the Gallup poll books. The Gallup poll books on business are really remarkable because they don't take truth based on logic and they don't take truth based on principles and books. They run polls and they ask people questions and they find out what makes people tick. And one of those books is Know Your Strengths. I think it's by Buckingham, and it comes with a questionnaire and helps you know your strengths. But one of the things that really struck me is that you get the helper's high. I mean, we're all, as human beings, looking for dopamine hits. Finish a job, put a check mark down on my to-do list, dopamine hit. I make someone laugh at my joke. Dopamine hit. Have a really good month financially. Dopamine hit. So when I get that interruptive phone call, that's really going to be for a lot of people an, inter an irritation. I say, hey, they really need me. Helpers high. And it feels good to get the helpers high. So nourish your helpers high. It feels really good to make someone feel good. When I'm on a phone call, can I compliment? You know, one thing I saw on the Get Back tracks, the Beatles, they never, ever complimented each other, ever. Read that, but I didn't realize it. But having watched about seven hours of it now, there's not a single time they go, wow, you really got that right. That's a great idea. They would just methodically work together tactfully and they would adopt and accept help from each other, but not really. There was no cheerleader. There was not much cheerleading. You, I could only imagine what they could have done if they had stuck together another three years because they were complimenting each other and uh, getting the helpers high from that. So just an idea. Okay, I want to close. I'll close here because I wanted to finish this in, in 30 minutes. And I would say about 85% of the people who started are still on. So I really appreciate that. But I want to talk about the, uh, the tough luck, bad results, conversations that you can have with yourself and with clients. Because as lawyers, clients come to us with insurmountable problems. And you know, if you're a member of the human race and you are trying hard and you are generally successful, you will have problems. So that reptile brain or whatever you want to call it will always take that problem and cause it to be irrational to some extent, and to be worrisome. Now, what's the reptile brain trying to do? Reptile brain, I believe, was designed to just get your attention. This is a problem. Work out it. Don't let it go. Get it resolved. That saber-toothed tiger is going to eat your child. Get out of the fields and get this resolved. Well, now it's, well, there was a car accident. We don't think it was our fault. It really was someone else's fault. 
We're not sure if it was our car. It was an independent contractor. We think we have insurance. We're not bad. We're not sure how badly the person is hurt. We're waiting to see what will happen. And I haven't slept in two weeks. I worry about it incessantly. So I came to see you so that you could help me with my creditor protection. Okay, well, what does Dale Carnegie recommend for this? Number one, get all the facts. Take copious notes, get all the facts from the client. The client has not even taken a good look at the problem because they're so emotional and disturbed by it. They don't really understand how important all the facts are, or they feel better having told you the situation. Then come up every viable alternative. Now, one viable alternative is going to be to ask someone else. And you should always say, you know, I'm just telling you what I know. I work a lot with some other people who are brilliant, and there may be other solutions. But there's three or four solutions here. One solution is do nothing, let's wait and see what happens. Another solution is let's hire a traffic reconstructionist to go out there while the tread marks are still out there. Yes, your insurance company did a traffic reconstruction study, but it might not have been good enough. Third, let's hire the best four lawyers in town, get their ideas before the other side hires these four lawyers, and then you got them working against you. Next, make a claim with your insurance. Every possible solution, write it down. And then you have saved your client having to write an essay exam. The exam is now multiple choice. What are they going to do? And so much of the angst and anxiety is caused by the brain saying, solve the problem of the saber tooth tiger. Solve the problem. I will torture you until you solve the problem. So what's next? The choice is made. Client decides what to do and now launches into action. Once the client launches into action, they feel much better. And they will say, I feel so much better. Because I, I don't know why I feel better, but I know now what I'm going to do. And the activity that I'm going to do will push out that negative chatter of the fear of the problem. The next part of this, which you do as part of this consultation, is you go through what's the worst thing that can happen here? I mean, really, what's the worst thing that can happen? It turns out to be a $20 million car accident. It's your responsibility. The car was in your medical practice. Your insurance is not going to cover it. Here's what's going to happen. If all this happens and the plaintiff doesn't settle and it goes to trial, then in two and a half to three years, we're going to have to put your medical practice into bankruptcy and we'll value it. And then we will ask the bankruptcy court to sell you the medical practice for the value of the practice, which is not going to be more than three to four hundred thousand dollars because you don't really because you don't you know you don't have a contract with your practice. So then three or four hundred thousand dollars is going to go to the plaintiff, and then you're going to have a new medical practice. And under section three sixty um, so section three sixty three of the bankruptcy code the creditor goes away, there's nothing more they can do. And if we, ex if we go to the plaintiff lawyer after he gets the verdict and we explain this, he'll probably accept 300,000 cash. So worst case scenario here is the insurance company is going to pay your defense costs, you're going to go to a jury trial, and then you're going to pay three to $500,000. Now your net worth is $10 million, you make a million dollars a year, how worried are you? Well, She's a lot less worried now than, than she was. 
let's say it's a million dollar problem. What's your net worth? Six million. It's a million dollar problem at most. That leaves you a net of five million. Let me ask you, when you were in high school, did you ever think you would be worth five million? No, I never thought I'd be worth a million. Can you retire on five million? Yeah. Okay, so here's the question. Are you going to let the worst case scenario of a million ruin your life for the next two and a half years? And you decide not to? Yeah, I decide not to. Okay, well, maybe see a counselor. Maybe you feel better now. Um, but page 175, actually, I'm missing a page. Live in daytight compartments. What can you do? Will the problem hit you today? No. The trial's in a year. What can you do about the problem today? Nothing. I've done everything possible. Okay? Problem's not going to hit you today. There's nothing you can do about it today. Are you going to worry about it today? And if they read that book, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living by Dale Carnegie, and they read the chapter on live your life in daytime compartments, because that's probably what we were designed to do, they can feel a lot better about the, uh, the situation. I'll close here with some food for thought. And I, I wrote an article for the ABA. It was a uh, one hour talk over at Stetson Law School for the Business Law Society, which I called the five client commandments. And then one of the uh, attendees wrote it into an article. She and I co-wrote it for an, an article on the, for the ABA. If you want a copy of it, I'm glad to send it. And uh, she took my talk and made it into the five commandments, which was really good delegation on my part. I, she was really bright. She was working for me. I said, you heard the speech. Just make it into a great article. And the next thing I do, she paraphrased what I did from a transcript, which we got from artificial intelligence. And then she made this PowerPoint. Number one, choose your clients and your customers and your employees carefully. You can't please everyone, so you have to please yourself. Our ratio in our practice is that 60% of the people who need our services and can afford our services will turn out to be good clients. 40% will not turn out to be good clients. They are rude or they are overly conscientious about money, or they have advisors who control them in the wrong ways, or they can't get their stuff together. So we've learned over the years how to identify the 60 and politely not hire or get hired by the 40. Now on the employee side, we know that only one in 10 stand to work for our office because we are a very, very difficult place to work because there's so many things to learn because we do so many things systematically. So we've learned how to identify those 10% by using psychological profile tests, usually basically the Omnia profile test. And number two is connect with your client. And this is one where the new surgeons and the new lawyers don't understand what a connection means, what a relationship means, even if it's a phone call. Does the lawyer care? Is the lawyer my friend? Did the lawyer explain what's going on? Is this someone I can like? Is this someone I will enjoy working with? For me, as a lawyer, it's about my lifestyle. I want my clients to be my friends. I want them to be clear communicators to the extent possible. I want to be a good listener. So I want to have the connection. Number three, I want to make sure I'm explaining. You know, people are visual or they're auditory or they're kinetic. I want to know which they are. I want to make sure they understand what I'm doing so that I can be a good mentor, a good teacher of what I know. Number four, I wanna know how my client thinks. 
I know how my typical client thinks. I know at the end of a call what I need to put in a letter. I think I know after 37 years. I know what they're going to forget about, and I know what's going to confuse them. And I know what what I didn't mention during the call because I didn't want to confuse them or cause them anxiety or overcomplicate it. I told them the three main things, but I didn't tell them the fourth thing. That goes in the letter where they can digest it. I had a feel for what they understood, but I also have a feel for what they didn't really understood, but they told me they understood it. So I want to know my client. So when my younger partners call me and go, Mrs. Jones is on the phone. She's concerned. She's confused. No, she's not. That's just how Mrs. Jones is. Just talk to her a little bit and she'll explain the whole thing to you. Just show her your, you'll care. She always blows steam. She likes to talk about the bill, but she always pays the bill. Whereas other clients, those topics mean different things. So get to know your client. And number five, unfortunately for all of us, cover your behind. What I tell the, the surgeons and the lawyers is just spend one magic minute, one magic minute, thinking what can go wrong here what's the most likely thing to go wrong and get it covered in writing well it's a beautiful trust but if you don't put your assets in it you're going to go through probate it's a beautiful document but as i explained to you i strongly recommend that you put in a disability clause and that you have a way to fire this person you're going into a 5149 and you're 49 as i discussed that's a very risky thing. I don't think your insurance is enough. It's not enough to say that. It's got to be put in writing. Two reasons. The first reason is it's the right thing to do. The client doesn't listen. She's reckless, but maybe she'll read a letter, maybe a copy of the letter to her CPA. But the self serving reason for the surgeon and for the young lawyer is the human tendency to blame. There is a human tendency to blame. And who's going to get blamed? Well, you may. So it's nice to have that letter that says, I am so sorry to hear about that car accident. I am so sorry to hear that that car was in the company. I am so sorry to hear that you only had 500000 of liability insurance. By the way, here's the letter I wrote you six years ago about that. You might want to go ahead and follow these instructions now. So. Hopefully, what I've given you today is food for thought on ways that you can improve your personal productivity, the productivity of other people in your company or firm, how you evaluate potential customers or clients, how you communicate with com potential customers or clients, and how you have a fantastic time doing all of that. So let me let me get some feedback here for the six of you who are still awake. Actually, 137. So I am improved. I am very very impressed and, and appreciative of that. Okay, Karen, what tape recorder do I use? I don't know. It's on Amazon for about $65, and then they can download it and listen to it. A lot of them use their phones, but I like to go ahead and give them that separate recorder. It shows how much I, I care, but I, Karen, if you just send me an email with the word recorder, I'll give you all the information. Okay, Michael, it was not Tony Robbins. The insanity quote was Rita Mae Brown, a feminist author. Perfect. I really like Tony Robbins because he summarizes what everyone said. Um, can you send a copy of Don't Forget the Five Commandments to Michael? Yes, I will. Um, let me see here. Okay, I think that's it. So I think the rest of you fell asleep. So let's see, let's do a shameless self-promotion here of what I'm going to cover because I need questions. So uh, I also need to remember how to get to page one. I think I go one, return. Nope, that didn't do it. But anyway, I need questions because in two weeks, the topic is answering estate and gift tax questions. And it will take me a long time 
to answer all of those questions if you don't send them to me. In addition, just to give you a preview of what we're going to do, here we go. Don't forget the saying, by the way, early to bed, early to rise, work like heck, and advertise. Uh, next week, Mathematics of Estate Planning with Professor Jerry Hash, pure genius. Then February 5th, estate planning techniques that we helped to invent or popularize. It includes the joint exempt step up trust, the self canceling installment note trust called a, a scrat, the teapot trust for IRA uh, planning, uh, estate view software, and even more. Then on the 12th, I'm going to answer questions uh, in, in question answers, probably. And then on the 13th, we're going to focus on qualified personal residence trust and S corporation planning. If you have a favorite speaker or you would like to give a little talk at one o'clock following one of these talks, we're going to start doing that and uh, looking forward to it very much. I hope that you improve a relationship today. I hope that you listen to somebody today that you haven't been listening to, and I hope that you start on the 10,000 hours of something that you would enjoy being a genius in. Thank you very much, and again, a lot of fun today. He really doesn't do a good job, but it was fun. Thank you.